On March the 15th, 1946, Sir Winston Churchill delivered a speech at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. This is when he famously announced to the world that, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. The curtain clearly divided the areas under Soviet influence from the rest of Europe. To many, this marked the beginning of the Cold War. Churchill's iron curtain may have been a figure of speech, but across many borders in Europe, this division took the form of physical barriers walls or structures to prevent capitalist infiltration of the paradise on earth that was real socialism. More likely, these barriers were to prevent citizens of Eastern Europe from fleeing repressive regimes and police states. In today's geographics, we're going to explore the most famous of these barriers, the Berlin Wall. This was one of the hotspots and key symbols of the Cold War, a concrete metaphor of a world torn asunder by ideological divide, living under the shadow of mutually assured destruction. But let's not overlook that this symbol had an actual impact on the lives of actual people. Heroes would risk their lives to seek freedom across the wall, help others escape, or simply be reunited with their loved ones on the other side. Heroes forever and ever, or maybe just for one day. After the end of World War II, the fate of Germany, Europe, and the whole world was determined by the Allied peace conferences in Yalta and Potsdam. It was there that the three greats, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, decided to split Germany into four Allied zones. The eastern part of the country went to the Soviet Union, the western part to the United States, Britain, and France. These respective zones later became the German Democratic Republic GDR, and the Federal Republic of Germany. The GDR was democratic only in name, with its citizens being ruled by a one-party system and kept in check by the relentless secret police, the Stasi. Berlin was an anomaly. It sat entirely in the eastern part of the country, and yet the Potsdam Agreement sanctioned that it should be divided into the four areas of influence. West Berlin became a capitalist enclave placed deep inside communist territory, an example of what true democracy was like right in the face of the GDR's center of power. In Nikita Khrushchev's words, West Berlin was stuck like a bone in the Soviet throat. Berlin would become one of the flashpoints where Cold War tensions threatened to escalate into full-blown conflict. Take for example the Soviet blockade of 1948, a complete block of supplies to West Berlin intended to starve the Western Allies out of the city. This is when the famous Berlin airlift took place. But despite the tensions, movement across the city sectors was relatively free. Travel still required special visas, paperwork, and plenty of bureaucracy, but it wasn't forbidden. East Berliners could enjoy Western entertainment and goods not allowed in their area, while West Berliners took advantage of the cheaper restaurant prices before watching the latest drama by master playwright Bertolt Brecht. It wasn't long before defectors and asylum seekers started taking advantage of the situation, crossing to West Berlin before leaving the GDR for good. From 1948 to June 1961, roughly 2.5 million people had escaped to the West. In one single day, August 12, 1961, 2,400 people had defected. That night, Soviet leader Khrushchev gave the East German government permission to close the city's border for good. It took only one night. The morning after, Berliners on both sides of the border woke up to realize that their city had suddenly turned into a darker shade of concrete gray. The wall had appeared, and it would stay there for a long time. The barriers erected on that August night were expanded and reinforced over the following week. They measured 155 kilometers, 97 miles in length, with the proper wall consisting of 43 kilometers, 27 miles of concrete separating the two sectors of the city. The remaining 112 kilometers, 70 miles, were mainly made of wire fencing, and they enclosed West Berlin from the surrounding GDR territory. When we say wall, it is easy to think of it as, well, simply a wall, but this was more precisely a complex fortification system, the main feature being two concrete barriers, each almost 4 meters or 12 feet high. These barriers ran in parallel with a death strip between them. The barriers were topped with barbed wire and electric fences fortified with 302 observation towers, as well as bunkers, vehicle trenches, and an estimated 55,000 landmines. The whole structure was patrolled by the infamous Grenztruppen, the highly trained and specialized border troops of the GDR. 
The wall still allowed for some crossing points, the most famous one being Checkpoint Charlie. The soldiers at these points looked and behaved like Grenztruppen, but they were actually part of the Stasi. The Stasi, or State Security Service, was the official internal security agency of the GDR government. They were an efficient and omnipresent secret police who closely monitored the lives of just about every citizen in East Germany, and especially East Berliners. Stasi agents maintained meticulous records about potential dissidents in their archives, ready to arrest and torture those suspected of plotting an escape, or even worse, a sabotage of the socialist state on behalf of those Western fascists. The wall had divided the very soul of a nation, but most of all, it had direct, lasting consequences on the lives of ordinary people, separating them from their lovers and their families. But to what extent would these ordinary people do the extraordinary to regain their freedom and the embrace of a loved one? In general, the wall achieved its purpose of preventing GDR citizens from reaching the West. The 2017 study from the Free University of Berlin estimates that 262 civilians were killed by Grenztruppen while climbing over the wall. However, there are many stories of daring, imaginative, and bonkers escape attempts which deserve to be remembered. The most iconic one was a leap to freedom by a guard himself. On August 15, 1961, two days after the erection of the very first barriers, 18-year-old East German police officer Konrad Schumann was assigned to guard a section at the corner of Bernaustrasse and Rupinerstrasse. There, he nervously paced back and forth, chain-smoking and occasionally pushing down the section of barbed wire he was supposed to watch over. At 4 p.m., when the other guards were distracted, Konrad dropped his cigarette and started running towards the barbed wire. As West Berliners started calling to come over, Konrad leapt over the barrier like an Olympian, dropped his gun, and landed in West Berlin, being carried away by a police car. Konrad Schumann had made it. He moved to Bavaria, he started a family, and he worked for Audi for 27 years. In the meanwhile, the photo of his jump had become one of the most recognizable mementos of the Cold War, a symbol of inspiration for all dissenters across the Soviet bloc. In 1963, another military employee decided he'd had enough of real socialism. This was Wolfgang Engels, technically a civilian, but employed as a driver by the East German Army. Instead of relying on agility like Schumann, Engels went for brute force. On the 16th of April, Engels borrowed a PSW-152 six-wheeled armored car and rammed it through the wall. As he drove it into the concrete barrier, he called out, I'm moving to the west! Who's coming? The PSW did bring down a section of the wall, but it got stuck in the debris. Engels left the vehicle, ran across the death strip, and climbed up the second barrier. When he got tangled in barbed wire, the Grenztruppen took aim and shot him twice. As he was almost in Western territory, the West German border guards could fire back, offering cover. Some West Berliners who had been drinking in a nearby bar came to help and freed Engels from the wire. Engels had lost consciousness. When he woke up, he was laying on the bar counter and he recalled, When I turned my head and saw all the Western brands of liquor on the shelf, I knew that I had made it. Two years before Wolfgang Engels stole the armored car, another plan had similarly relied on brute force. In December 1961, a 27-year-old train engineer, Harry Detterling, was fed up with living with something that just wasn't fair, and so he decided to go off the rails on a crazy train. Harry had discovered an abandoned train track that still ran from an East Berlin suburb into West Berlin. The track connected the two sectors via a seven-foot-wide passage still left open in the wall. Detterling volunteered to drive a train that ran on the nearest route and plotted the last train to freedom. On the 5th of December, Harry invited 24 family members and friends on board, and he launched the train full throttle towards West Berlin, smashing through the security barriers. Once Harry had driven his 24 fellow escapees to the other side, one of the passengers rang West Berlin's police to inform them, Hello, we've just escaped with a train. When a massive armored or speeding vehicle was not available, you had to rely on stealth or incredible skill to make your way out. In 1964, 30 students from West Berlin dug what was dubbed Tunnel 57. It took several months to complete and ended up being 145 meters long and 90 centimeters high, or 158 yards and 3 feet respectively. The Stasi eventually discovered it, but 57 people managed to escape before they did. My favorite tunnel, though, has to be the Senior Citizens Tunnel, led by an 81-year-old man and a group of seniors who spent two weeks digging quite a big tunnel. Unlike Tunnel 57, this gallery was high enough so that escapees could walk through it rather than crawl. According to one of these senior citizens, they had made it so because we wanted to walk to our freedom with our wives comfortably and unbowed. 
From the depths below the streets to the heights above the buildings, Horst Klein can lay claim to the most artistic attempt. Horst was a trapeze artist who had been banned from performing because of anti-communist beliefs. In December 1962, the acrobat performed a tightrope walk over a disused power cable, balancing his way to the west. The guards failed to shoot him, but Klein eventually fell from the line, breaking both of his arms. Fortunately, he had landed in West Berlin. But if we were to give a prize for inventiveness and determination, it would go to the legends that are the Bethke brothers. Ingo was the first to go. As a former border guard, Ingo Bethke was familiar with the banks of the river Elbe, north of Berlin, and the defenses around it. When he decided to flee East Berlin in 1975, Bethke returned to the river with a friend and their sophisticated escape craft, an air mattress. Ingo and friends traversed a minefield before reaching the river, and then they silently paddled on their air mattress into West Germany. After Ingo's defection, his brother Holger came under scrutiny and pressure from the Stasi. It was time for him to plot his getaway too. First he took up archery and practiced for several months. Then he identified a tall building close to the wall that overlooked West Berlin. In May of 1983, he stuck into the top floor with his trusty bow and shot an arrow into West Berlin, an arrow that was attached to a thin metal cable. Ingo was waiting on the other side and fastened the wire to his car. And finally, Holger launched himself from the building, riding the zip line that he and Ingo had created, zooming over the baffled border guards. Ingo and Holger could have stopped there, and they'd still be entitled to star in the pre credit sequence of the next James Bond movie, but they weren't done yet. You see, there was a third brother, Egbert, and he was still stuck in the East. Over the following years, Ingo and Holger took flying lessons and acquired two ultralight planes. They then painted them in military colors, including Soviet-style red stars. We are only left wondering if they wrote, I can assure you this is a MiG on the fuselage. Anyway, with their crafts ready, the two brothers flew eastward over the wall, landed in East Berlin, and picked up a very surprised Egbert. Miraculously, they were able to fly back to West Berlin in complete safety. Egbert later recalled, I thought I'd never see my brothers again, but they came out of the sky like angels and took me to paradise. Many escape attempts saw as protagonists young couples willing to start a new life away from the repressive atmosphere of the GDR. A particularly spectacular one saw as protagonists an Austrian boy named Heinz Meixner and a local girl, Marguerite Thoreau. While working in East Berlin, Heinz and Marguerite had fallen in love and decided to marry. When GDR authorities denied them permission to be married, the two lovers they hatched a plan to escape. On May 5, 1963, Heinz hired a convertible, then removed its windshield and deflated its tires to make his car a as low to the ground as possible. He then drove the car to Checkpoint Charlie with Marguerite and her mother hiding in the back. When they reached the inspection point, Heinz ducked and slammed his foot on the accelerator. The guards had lowered the barrier, but the modified convertible it easily sped below it, driving the two lovers into the west. Their getaway, though dangerous, was relatively quick compared to the predicaments of our next couple of smitten lovers. These were Eckhart and Regina. West Berliner Eckhart had traveled to East Berlin in 1967 to accompany his father to a school reunion. At the event, he met East Berliner Regina, who was also there with her father. Lightning struck and the seeds of passions they were sowed. Immediately after returning home, the two started exchanging letters. But their relationship was a triangle from the start, and the third uneasy, overbearing presence was the Stasi. Eckhart and Regina they soon realized that the communist secret police were steaming open and reading their letters. The Stasi one day arrested Regina and questioned her. At first, they wanted to find out if she wanted to flee to the West. Of course, she denied this. Then they asked her, do you love this man? She replied, I am 18 years old. I don't even know what love is. That apparently left the Stasi a bit confused, but what the agents did know was that this person was a flight risk and they had to remove any temptation that would pull her to the West. So these agents spent six months of their time, energy, and resources getting an 18-year-old girl to break up with her boyfriend. Regina was no fool, though, and she made sure the agents saw her going out for coffee with other men. In the meantime, she continued to send letters in secret to Eckhart with the help of her gran. Eventually, the couple managed to meet in Hungary, where East Germans were sometimes given permission to travel. It was their first encounter since the school reunion. Regina recalled, It was in front of a hotel. He was standing in front of me, and I had no words. We went to the hotel. He came, he saw, he conquered. Veni vidi vici. And with that, I just suppose we have to say that you have to make the most of your Stasi free time. The couple agreed to complete their college studies first before finding a way to be together. In early 1971, Eckhart had a plan. He paid a man to extract Regina from the GDR by evading the wall through a tunnel. However, the attempt failed before it could even begin when the police discovered the underground passage. 
Later the same year, Regina tried again. She traveled to Romania, where a man agreed to drive her to Yugoslavia and then smuggle her to Austria. She was squeezed into the space previously occupied by the fuel tank, right under the car's trunk. Border guards searched the car, but luckily did not think about searching underneath the trunk. During the ordeal, Regina had passed out. When she woke up, she was greeted by the driver, saying, You made it to freedom. Three days later, Regina flew to West Berlin, where she was finally reunited with Eckhart. In 2014, the couple were still together and were interviewed by the UK's ITV News. They asked Regina if Eckhart had been worth her predicament. She replied, Of course he was. This couple's story was clearly a success, but sometimes unions would prove even more difficult, especially if the stranded parties were not adults, but rather a mother and her newborn child. In January 1961, a little boy was born in an East Berlin hospital to Sigrid and Hartmut Paul. The birth had severe complications, as little Torsten was born with organ damage and internal bleeding. The wall was still eight months away, so the couple were able to take Torsten to a better equipped hospital in the West. Doctors were able to treat Torsten, and in July, Sigrid was finally allowed to take him home. Torsten's health it had been temporarily secured, but he still needed medicine and special formula that was imported from the West, which Sigrid picked up every Monday. Then, on the night between the 12th and the 13th of August, everything changed. A wall had sprung up in town, separating the Soviet sector from the West. Sigrid now had to apply for a permit to cross to the other side, but GDR authorities denied it. Our baby food is good enough, they said. Within days, Torsten's health deteriorated and he was coughing up blood. The pools took him to the hospitals, but the only doctors who could help were on the other side of the wall. Transferring patients across the wall was allowed only for those with a heart condition. A sympathetic doctor falsified Torsten's papers to pretend that he was a cardiac patient and ferried him to the West. For the next few months, until Torsten turned one, Sigrid was able to see her baby only for a few hours at a time and only after painful negotiations with GDR bureaucrats to obtain a short-lived visa. Authorities eventually issued a blanket refusal. Sigrid and Hartmut would not be allowed to see their child anymore. The only option for them was to escape to the West. The Poles acquired fake passports and were ready to flee to West Berlin via a Scandinavian country when they received a message from a friend. The Stasi were onto them, so they should abort the attempt. As a means to find allies in their next escape attempt, the Poles welcomed into their flat some students who were also plotting to flee. All of these students were arrested shortly afterwards, and the couple was next. Both were questioned, and Sigrid was imprisoned for six months without a trial. In August 1963, Sigrid and Hartmut were charged with failing to reveal the students' escape plans, and they were sentenced to four and a half years in prison. Meanwhile, Torsten remained in the West Berlin Hospital, fed through a tube and looked after by the medical staff, whose letters occasionally made it to the Pauls in prison. Almost two years into their sentence, Sigrid and Hartmut were suddenly released. They had been ransomed by the West German government, who was essentially buying the freedom of thousands of political prisoners. They were free, but still not allowed to travel to the West. After 11 more agonizing months, Torsten was well enough to return home. He was four and a half when he was reunited with his parents. They were total strangers to him, but eventually their relationship blossomed. Finally, the Pauls could be a family. But the Stasi they had one final ruthless twist in reserve. After the wall finally came down in 1989, East German citizens were allowed access to the files kept on them by the secret police. When Sigrid reviewed her records, she discovered that the Stasi had tried to recruit Torsten to spy on his own family. He had not caved. Plagued by poor health through his adult life, he always remained loyal and extremely close to Sigrid. <laughs> Our final love story is a bit unconventional. In 1979, a Swedish woman named Aya Ritter chose to marry the Berlin Wall in a small but intimate ceremony. She then accepted the surname Berliner Mauer or Berlin Wall in German. Aya Ritter was diagnosed with a condition called objectophilia, a condition where the afflicted experiences feelings of love, attraction, arousal, and commitment for a particular inanimate object. Mrs. Berliner Mauer claimed that she fell in love with the structure when she first saw it on television when she was seven. She began collecting his pictures and saving up for visits. It was on her sixth trip in 1979 that she finally tied the knot with Mr. Berliner Mauer. Aya Ritter insists that she had a full, loving relationship with the wall, albeit a long-distance one, as she was based in Leiden, northern Sweden. I find long, slim things with horizontal lines very sexy. The Great Wall of China is attractive, but he's too thick. My husband is sexier. When the wall was torn down in 1989, hardline communists may have been horrified at the turn of events, but Aya Ritter was devastated. 
What they did was awful. They mutilated my husband. According to the Telegraph, she has since shifted her affections to a nearby garden fence. After 28 years of living under the shadow of the wall, liberation for East Berliners arrived swiftly, almost by total surprise. The chain of falling dominoes was set in motion in the spring of 1989. Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev made the unprecedented decision to grant more autonomy to countries within the Warsaw Pact. The first to take advantage of this was the Hungarian government, which opened its borders with Austria. Soon, East Germans started pouring into Hungary so that they might cross the border and escape to democracy. At the end of the summer, another 4,500 escapees sought refuge in the West German embassy in Prague. When, on the 30th of September, they were granted asylum by the West German government, the GDR had to yield. Its president, hardline communist Erich Honecker, allowed for their departure with the condition that they traveled via East German territory. The 4,500 were transferred to Leipzig, from which they boarded special trains to the west. The convoys were stormed by more dissidents, while others preferred to stay, instigating a series of demonstrations demanding for democratic reforms. These culminated with the March for Freedom and Peace on the 9th of October. Honecker understood that he had been beaten, and he resigned, being succeeded by Egan Krenz. On the 9th of November, Krenz's cabinet convened a press release to announce that border controls to the west would be finally lifted. Italian journalist Riccardo Ehrman asked Minister of Propaganda Gunter Schabowski when the restrictions would be lifted. The Politburo's plan was to grant freedom of movement only on the 17th. But Schabowski, poorly briefed and unprepared, improvised with a mumbled, so forth, immediately. Apparently, Ehrman had been tipped to ask that question by an insider of the Politburo, someone who knew that Chabowski would bungle the press conference. Whether by coincidence or by design, Chabowski's words had a momentous effect. Thousands of East Berliners took to the streets and marched to the wall, drinking beer and chanting, Tor auf, open the gate. Outnumbered and without orders, the once feared Grenztrupper obeyed the crowd and opened the checkpoints. The city was reunited. As the greatest street party in the history of the world raged on, thousands of Berliners from both sides tore down the wall that had scarred their lives for more than a generation. Eleven months later, the two Germanys were reunited, like so many of its citizens had been over the previous decades. The reunification allowed for many families to finally embrace again. Many of those who had fled to the West were able to return to their old homes in East Berlin. One of them was Konrad Schumann, the soldier who had made the leap. Conrad reunited with his family and friends, but some held a grudge against him. They felt he had deserted and left them behind. Years later, in 1998, Conrad walked into the woods outside of Berlin and hanged himself. During the years of separation and during the months leading to reunification, East Germans had manifested two ways to defy authority. Some had braved death to escape to the West. Others had preferred to stay and, if necessary, protest for democratic reform. So, who were the real heroes? Those who faced the guns and the barbed wire with a gutty mix of ingenuity, courage, and good fortune? Or those who stayed behind, enduring the stupidity of bureaucrats, the hardship of communist life, and the bullying of the Stasi? You could argue that both were heroes in different ways. But in an ideal place, an ideal world, there shouldn't be any need for heroes. Playwright Bertolt Brecht, the East Berliner, put it perfectly. Unhappy the land that is in need of heroes. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do subscribe to this channel. When you're subscribing, hit that notification bell so you find out when we put out a new video. Also, why not subscribe to another channel I do? It's called Highlight History. It's sort of a today in history thing. You will find that linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.